What is up guys and welcome back to my channel where I put out new photography related content almost every Monday. So if you like this video and you want to see more like it, you can go and check out the other videos on my channel and you can subscribe to get a new video almost every Monday. Do hit the like button, it does really help me out. Okay, so a few months ago I made this video pointing out a recurrent problem on the subreddit r slash analog with the way that women are photographed, particularly in the not safe for work tagged posts. This video is still one of my top favorite videos that I've ever made, so if you haven't seen it, please do go check it out. <laughs> I worked really hard on it, and I guarantee you will find it interesting, even if you're not a photographer. In this video, I point out that many of the not safe for work tag posts on r slash analog feature the same few repetitive, tropey images of young, naked, skinny white women. These images are so oversaturated and repetitive on this sub that I see some variation of them on my homepage every single day. And in fact, I was banned from the sub for pointing this out in the comment section of one of them. Moderators on r slash analog immediately remove any and all comments criticizing these NSFW photos for their subject matter. Essentially protecting these lazy, repetitive, and exploitative images from criticism, other film photography communities like r slash film photography and r slash photo critique are not so quick to prevent similar discourse on similar images. So this particular brand of silencing criticism is a problem that's very specific to r slash analog in my opinion. So anyway, Anyway, after working very hard on that video and delving deep into the canon of r slash analog, I have since maintained a healthy fascination <laughs> with the discourse on the sub. So when I saw this post announcing the publication of r slash analog's first ever community zine project put together by the moderators of r slash analog themselves, I was immediately intrigued. I clicked the link at the bottom of the post and came to this page where I learned that the zine itself was selling for only $10 and was completely not for profit, meaning all of the money that I spent on this book would go directly to the cost of creating the physical object and not into the bank accounts of any of the mods who I have admittedly developed a somewhat bitter resentment towards. So I decided to buy it and of course make this video. It was a lot more than $10. <laughs> The book itself was priced in USD, and after taxes and fees it came up to $16 USD, which is a whopping $22 Canadian. But then, it didn't ship to Canada, so I had to put out an Instagram ask, asking if any of my Instagram followers were in the States, and if any of them would be willing to receive this book, and then reship it to me up in Canada. And luckily, somebody was Will Hopkins. Shout out, Will Hopkins. Go check him out. Here's his Instagram. Thank you so much, Will getting this book into my hands. So I put in his shipping address and paid for it to be shipped to him. Once he received it, he then shipped it to me, and it turns out that international import fees and, and cross-border transportation and everything is very expensive. It was 29 something USD to ship it to me, which worked out to be 41 Canadian dollars. So all told, this $10 book cost me $63, because I'm Canadian. For that price, I was really hoping that it would have some kind of juicy content that I could roast for you all in this video. And in fact, it did not have a single not safe for work image in it. See, I later found this post that was the first ever post relating to the zine project and it announces the rules for submissions and one of the rules is no NSFW content. Interesting, right? Because NSFW content is so rigorously protected on this sub. The reason given is that although the mods do see these NSFW posts as valid artistic expression, debatable, there would be potential issues for distribution of the zine. I confess, I was somewhat disappointed upon learning this, as you may be <laughs> if you watched my first video and you're here for round two. But after taking some time to read through this book, I came to appreciate it for what it is. It is a little sampling of the state of film photography on average, and I actually think that is pretty cool. I like this book. It's someone's passion project, and I like to imagine that that someone isn't one of the self-righteous dickheads soapboxing about how big tits in Golden Hour Sun on Portrait 400, number 5486, carries on the artistic legacy of Michelangelo, nor the guy who banned me from the sub for making this comment, because I don't like that guy. <laughs> no, this book is pretty fun. It's an enjoyable read. I enjoyed my time with it. And heck, I'd even recommend that you pick yourself up a copy if you live in the US and this does indeed only cost $16 after taxes and shipping. It's bankrolled by Reddit community funds, which means that the entire project was not for profit and the goal was to make it as cheap and accessible as possible. I appreciate that a lot. I think it's really cool. It isn't like other photography books where the images are curated or revolve around a certain theme or genre or subject. They aren't all by the same artist, nor even all by professional photographers. Instead, this book has a little bit of everything. It's a sampling 
revealing an assortment of snapshots and frames from the lives of many different people, seen through as many different eyes and lenses. It shows the breadth of what you can do with film photography. It shows the good, the bad, the mundane, the beautiful. In this video, instead of roasting the book that I thought I was buying, <laughs> I'm going to explore what the book that I got teaches us about the state of modern film photography. Using this as a case study, I'll share some of my favorite photographs and why they strike me, what elements of the composition make them so compelling, and I'll also share a few of my least favorites for educational purposes only. Just a very light roasting. Like a toasting, if you would. I'm kind of refreshed after reading this, and maybe somewhere down in the frigid bowels of my heart, there's a slight warming happening towards r slash analog. Not necessarily towards the moderators, but to the community and the people who took the time to put this together. For no reason other than to serve the community and to help fellow photographers see their work in print. Okay, the specs, the zine, let's talk about it. So first off, there's very little information in this book. There's a foreword reflecting on the state of film photography in the digital age and a quote by Ansel Adams. There's this page of credits, which is mostly Reddit usernames, but there's Elisha Zapita who did the graphic design. Thank you, Elisha, it looks great. And there's also Joel Wagland. Don't know what they did, but thank you, Joel Wagland. Also, uh, thanks to you slash Lenny the Mage, who appears to have had some hand in putting this together, and he was the one who shot the cover image. I don't know why he's not mentioned in the credits. Sorry, Lenny the Mage. The zine itself contains 206 photos from as many different creators, and there are 57 different film stocks represented on these pages. 57! Can you name 57 film stocks? I couldn't. <laughs> the most popular film stock in this book is, drumroll please, Portra 400, <laughs> with 37 images, which is approximately 17% of the total images being shot on it, including two of the black and white images. The second most popular film stock is, take a guess, Kodak Gold 200, which would actually have been my choice for first most popular. As you may have guessed by this, Kodak is the most popular film manufacturer represented in this book with 125 images taken on 18 different Kodak stocks. I was actually pretty surprised by the lack of love for Fujifilm. There was only 21 photos taken on Fujifilm in this zine and only seven different Fuji stocks represented. Of the black and white stocks, Ilford HP5 was the most popular with 14 of 58 black and white images taken on it. There were a few stocks that I had never heard of, including Afka APX400, Ultrafine Extreme 100, and Silbira Pan 50. There were some stocks that I was surprised didn't occur more often. I like to think of Cinestill as being like a cult classic, but only six of the images in this zine were taken on it. There was only two shots taken on Fuji Velvia, which is a color positive kind of slide film. Very cool, I've got a roll in my fridge right now. And only one photo was taken on Lomochrome Metropolis. It seems like most of the photos were taken on 35 millimeter, but there are definitely a few 120s, and even this one, which was taken on a J Lane speed plate. For all the memes about classic cars and gas stations being super repetitive tropes in film photography, I actually didn't see any pictures of gas stations in the entire book, even in the cinematic and night section, which did surprise me. There are a lot of pictures of classic cars, but a lot of them are really, really cool and unique, despite the fact that their subject matter is somewhat of a trope. This particular shot of just the bumper of a classic car does recur a few times, but I can't blame the artists because I have taken this shot too. <laughs> Which actually is another funny thing that I found about the zine was that there's a few photos in here that I have taken. <laughs> These are not my photos, but I've taken nearly identical photos in the past. Uh, this one of the Calgary Library like made me laugh out loud because I took a nearly identical photo when I visited Calgary and I thought that I was being really clever <laughs> with the sun. And it makes me wonder how many other photographers have stood in that spot at the same time of day and taken the same photo and felt like they were being really clever as well. I'm not going to critique any of these photos for being derivative or repetitive because glass houses. <laughs> Speaking of critique though, I did go through and tab all of my favorite photos in purple and all of my least favorite photos in rainbow washi tape. I have 12 least favorites and 21 favorites. I'm not gonna talk about all of them. Oh my God, this video would be like an hour long, but I am going to talk about some select examples of each. The photos I talk about are not the best or worst in my opinion, but they're the most interesting to talk about. I also want to say real quick that I mean absolutely no personal offense to any of these photographers. These are just my opinions on the art itself and I'm sharing them because I love breaking down photos into their constituent parts and talking about them at length. Okay, so half of these have first and last names and the other half just have usernames and you're just gonna have to make your peace with that now. <laughs> so there were several photos in the first section, nature and landscapes that I really, really liked, including this one by Elisha, the graphic designer. Good job, Elisha, I love it. But the one that I wanna talk about the most is this one here by Emma Hartman. Now, this photo has 
excellent compositional balance. Like it's divided cleanly into thirds, one, two, three, You've got the rule of thirds horizontally, and you also have the rule of thirds vertically because the bus takes up almost exactly the middle third. It's perfectly positioned in the frame and a very obvious subject. The bottom third is blurry, drawing your eyes upwards. The middle third is receding upwards, also drawing your eye upwards. And then finally, at the top third, you get that payoff with the yellow bus, the blue mountains, and the pink sky. The color palette itself is unusual. If you had a blue sky, it would just be a pretty standard blue, green, and yellow color scheme, which is classic anal analogous, anal analogous, and this one. But instead, we have a pink sky, which lends this beautiful split complementary color scheme instead. So given everything that I love about this picture, you might understand why this picture is among my least favorites in this section. There's nothing about the composition that draws your eye in any one particular direction. Where Emma Hartman's has the bus as just a very obvious subject, this picture doesn't have a subject, really. There's a few elements that compete with each other for attention, and the composition rewards none of them. There's the beam of light hitting a blurry bush, there's an upturned chair that definitely draws a little bit of attention, but it's just being missed by this patch of sun, and this second patch of sun is illuminating a slightly out of focus pile of garbage. There's also no intentionality behind the color palette. It's just green and brown. A large portion of the bottom half of the image is just taken up by blurry brown. I'm sure this scene looked a lot more magical in person, and it does make me wonder what the photographer saw that day that the camera was unable to capture. Fast forwarding through the book, here are some honorable mentions. Oh my god, I love these photos, but I don't have much to say about them. Until we get to this one, which I just love. I think it's really, really cool. It's by Sean Alves, and it was shot on Kodak Color Plus 200. And when I first saw it, I thought the people were just laying in the snow. I was wondering why there was a bunch of mostly unclothed people lying in the snow until I realized that it's actually sand. I suspect this photographer did something fancy when they developed this photo to overdevelop the highlights and maintain the shadows. Because although the highlights are overexposed, the image itself is not blown out. The shadow details are well balanced and you can definitely see the details are still intact. And also you do have a clear subject. You've got this guy in the middle surrounded by enough empty space that he has breathing room to be the subject, despite all of the other people nearby who are similar sizes and shapes. It's not cluttered, but it's scattered. I like that. Now, I don't like this one for many of the same reasons. It has no breathing room, no empty space, no clear subject, no dividing lines. It's overpoweringly dark, like Sean's is overpoweringly white, but for what? It just obscures things that otherwise might make the image interesting. I'm realizing that a lot of my least favorite shots are of forests. I think that's because the human eye sees depth a lot better than a two-dimensional image is capable of reproducing. And that's what makes forests so beautiful in person. I've done this. When you see a beautiful forest scene and you think that it's beautiful enough to stand alone without a subject, but it's usually not once the image is flattened. However, when you have mist or smoke or something that adds that depth back in, you can get a really, really beautiful image of a forest, like this one by Joanna Rayner. Anyway, now that we're into the black and white shots, there's a bunch that I really love here, but I think it would be interesting to talk about this one that has this really, really, really cool triangular focal point. For me, this is a sleeper shot because overall the image doesn't have anything particularly interesting in it, but the composition is just fantastic. This is shot by a user Simple Perception, which username checks out because this is a very simple photo, but got great perception. I love how stark this triangle of focal points is, how you have this line connecting two of them, and then this kind of half and half dark on the bottom, light on the top, and then the third focal point is just this pitch black silhouette standing out among this bright area. The middle of the frame is blank, you've got to work for the payoff, and you find it by looking at the composition. Good photography, in my opinion, is often about capturing mundane or familiar scenery in unfamiliar and unique ways, and I think that this image does that very well. Moving on, the final photo that I'm going to talk about is in the street photography section and it is by user Jomon. This photo, oh my god, it was captured over the course of 166 days using a soda can as a camera. He has a YouTube video explaining how he made it so the soda can camera thing does check out. Talk about capturing familiar scenery in unique and unexpected ways. This is probably the most unique way that you could possibly have photographed this tower. But this is probably one of my favorite shots in the entire book just because this photographer really takes advantage of what makes analog photography so interesting. That's everything that I had to say. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video was fun. I hope it was interesting. I hope that you're inspired to buy a copy of the r slash analog zine project and appreciate all of the wonderful photography that it contains. So yeah, I will see you guys next week with another photography related video. If you liked this video, do leave a like, leave a comment letting me know what you thought. And in the meantime, I want you guys to stay sharp and don't forget to keep shooting. Bye guys.